Welcome to Casual Friday. So I thought I'd tell you a little bit about my trip to the Netherlands and my knitting and yarn adventures while I was there. There was a little bit of that here and there and uh, some of the things that we did and the things that we saw and some of my observations about Dutch culture and um, just the experience of, of being there. As I've mentioned before, my oldest daughter is living in the Netherlands for a year. She's working as an au pair for a family who lives in a town called Pijnacker, which is between Rotterdam and The Hague. So they're actually quite close to each other. Everything is very close to each other. The Netherlands is a small country and there is a lot of public transportation of all sorts. There's the train that gets you from city to city and country to country. There is the metro and that these are sort of self-contained metro, sort of like a subway line that uh, will take you from, in this case, from The Hague to the Rotterdam and all the towns in between, but there's another metro up in the Amsterdam area. And I assume that there's one in the Utrecht area as well. There are the four cities, Amsterdam, Utrecht, the Hague and Rotterdam are sort of a, a mega, megalopolis, I think they call it. It's a four city major metropolitan area that I think half of the population of the Netherlands lives there in this fairly small area. And so there's the, the train system, then there's the various metro systems, and then within a city there'll be a tram system, which is kind of like light rail. And we were able to get a, what they call an, an anonymous pass. So there's no picture identification that's associated with it. But you can load up money onto these cards. And then as you use one of the pieces of public transportation, you can, uh, you check in with your card, you tap it and it beeps. And then when you get off the, the uh, tram or train or metro, you, you check out and it deducts the cost of your your journey from your card. Whenever I travel overseas and people discuss jet lag, there's always this discussion about whether it's easier to travel west or east. And I've heard a lot of people say that it's easier at least for them to travel west. And I have not found that to be the case. I'm not sure that it's easier for me in any one direction or the other. I think it has a lot to do with what time of day it is that I'm leaving, uh, how long the trip is, and then what time it is when I arrive. So this flight was eight hours from Minneapolis to Amsterdam. And then there's a seven hour time difference. There's seven hours ahead of us. So we left in the early evening on Wednesday and we arrived in Amsterdam at nine in the morning, which would have been two in the morning our time. So we were very tired. It's very hard to sleep on an airplane. And we had to get train tickets to Rotterdam because we spent the first few days at a hotel in Rotterdam, which is a very close, a city that's very close to where my daughter um, is living with her family, the Dutch family. Um, so we had to get there. So we, our daughter told us, you know, take the train to Rotterdam Central train station and then you can just walk. It's a few blocks away. Uh, to the hotel where we were staying. So we're very tired and trying to navigate all of this and we got to the hotel and we assumed we would not be able to check in until the afternoon and we would have to spend the day st keeping ourselves awake. Uh, our daughter was working that day uh, and she, so she wanted us to come visit her in Pinocker for the afternoon and we just didn't know if we were gonna be able to, to do it or not mentally just and physically being able to do it. We got to the hotel and they had rooms available for, available for us right away. So we we went up to our rooms and we just rested for about an hour and then we thought, well, let's let's find our way to Pinocker and we'll visit with Nina. And so 
she told us which of the two Pinocker train stations to uh, or metro station uh, to get off on and she met us there and then took us with her uh, to a grocery store because because that's part of her job is to do the daily grocery shopping to make uh, dinner for the family so she works four days a week monday tuesday thursday friday on wednesdays dutch children at least the younger children, I don't know about high school age, but the younger children don't have school. Uh, at They come home at lunchtime and they're home for the day. So for many families, one parent or the other does not work on Wednesdays. And in the case of, I'm gonna call them the Pinockers. That's not their name, but that's what I'm gonna call them. So in, in their case, the, um, the dad is the one who doesn't work on Wednesdays. So he takes care of their baby and gets the kids to school and picks them up at lunch. And he's there um, during the day. And our daughter works Monday, Tuesday, and then Thursday, Friday. So the day we got there was the day before Good Friday. And so on Thursday, the kids actually got out of school an hour earlier. So we walked with her to the school to pick up the kids so we could meet the three that are in school. And uh, they, and then we came home with them. And, we, and my daughter said, she said it was like her family was like the husks of her family were sitting there on the couch because we were just zombies. Now there, there are four children in this family and one of them is an infant. And on Thursdays, she stays with her grandparents all day long. So we didn't get to meet the baby that day, but we got to see, we got a tour of the house and it's a, it's a modern house. It's not, a lot of places in Europe are really old. This town had, has a lot of newer housing. And so the house that, that she's living in was built in the 80s. But it's, it's pretty typical from what I'm understanding about Dutch architecture where the, the house isn't terribly wide, but there are a number of floors that go up. So she had told us that her room is on the top floor and that the stairs are very steep and kind of windy. And we just didn't, couldn't really imagine what that was like because certainly in the hotel that we were staying in Rotterdam, we were taking an elevator and it was a newer constructed building. So when she took us on a tour of the house, then we understood these are narrow stairs and they really kind of wind, wind up. And, and I was thinking, whoa, how do older people handle something like that or how do you teach a little kid to go up and down stairs like that so and I was like how do you even move furniture into a home like that those these are all questions that I had but I was very tired and we didn't get the answers to them that day um, but we did get to see our daughter and then we went back to Rotterdam and then that night um, when she was done with work she took the metro to Rotterdam and then she was with us for the rest of the trip because Starting on Good Friday, the, the children in South Holland um, have two weeks of vacation. One of the things that I did do while we were with it in Pinecker was I took out the orange socks that I was knitting for the five-year-old. I had guessed on how big around his leg was because my daughter could not find a tape measure in the house. So I just guessed at what I thought a five-year-old's leg would be like. And I guessed wrong and the socks were too tight for him. And so I knew I was going to have to re-knit them. And I said, well, do you, do you like them? Because if you don't like them, that's okay. I won't re-knit them. And he's like, no, I don't like them. And my daughter said, well, do you not like them because they're orange or do you not like them because they're too tight? And he said, well, because they're too tight. And, but I had brought a couple other balls of sock yarn with me. And I pulled them out and I said, well, you could have a different color. Would you, you know, would you rather have red or green? And he wanted green. So I cast on for a pair of green socks for him. And that is the knitting project that I was working on when I had time on our trip. Very close to Pinocker, like three or four miles away, is the town of Delft, where the Royal Delft ceramics are made and have been made for several hundred years. So then our next day we went to Delft and we toured the, we did a factory tour. So we, we went in and we saw um, a woman hand painting a bowl. Um, we used one of their traditional uh, patterns and we got to watch her for a while. And then we got to see 
sort of like a museum, a display of various Delft uh, porcelain products that, that they had been painted over the years. And, and some of them were portraits of people painted. Some of them were dishes or vases or various types of, of things. So we saw all that. And then we got to go into the factory. And the factory is where they actually make the plates and bowls and vases and various uh, tiles and all of that sort of thing. And we got to see the people who were um, creating those things. And then that's where they have all the kills. And then after the artists are painting the ceramics, they get fired again in the in the kills uh, in the factory. So that was really fascinating. I always love watching artisans make, um, make these kinds of things. So I could see why the authentic Delft ceramics or porcelain, whatever it is, why they're so expensive. They're just beautifully done and they don't look anything like the cheap souvenir stuff that you see hanging in all the tourist shops. Just amazingly beautiful. So while we were in Delft, we did a canal tour. There's canals, of course, all over Amsterdam. And Delft is really a university town. And I think most of the population of Delft is uh, university students and so there were a lot of like dormitories and and different university societies where those buildings were on canals and so we had a Dutch student university student uh, who who spoke in Dutch and in English explaining to us the different buildings that we were seeing and one of the things that I remember from being in Amsterdam a few years ago when we had done a bike tour of Amsterdam is that the houses were very narrow. And the reason for that is that they were taxed based on how wide they were. So they would have these narrow houses that would be very deep and then tall. And then they were also taxed on the number of windows they had. So, and then he told us a little story about there's one house that didn't have a, do a front door to it because the person who built that house discovered that the laws with the taxes had to do with where the front door was. And if so, since there was no door that was facing the canal, the door was in the back, he he either avoided getting the taxes altogether or they were substantially lower. But I, I thought it was interesting. But it was because those houses were so narrow, that's why they have these little narrow staircases that wind up um, because you can't have a big wide uh, staircase in a house that's that narrow. So that kind of shed some light on the, those treacherous stairs that we were finding in, in different buildings. On Saturday night, we met the Pinocker family in Rotterdam for dinner. And we had dinner at a building, it's called Hotel New York. And the building is in the old Highland America line um, port building. So it's the building where the tr if we're immigrants, who were leaving Europe for the United States would come by train to that building. That was the port. That was the the departure point, and they could stay in there in the hotel until it was time for their ship to leave. And so that was a really fun thing. It was right on the water, and it was really fun to be in that building. But it was there that we finally got to meet. Well, we got to meet both of the parents of the kids. And then we got to meet the baby. And it was that baby that I had knit a couple of hats and a sweater for when my daughter first got to the Netherlands. And I had I sent them to, to them. And I find that baby, I get pictures sent to me several times a week. I get to see this baby growing. And she is adorable. She's chubby cheeks. She's so cute. And she's the fourth kid. And so everybody's very relaxed. She's happy to sit on anybody's lap. And I got to hold her. Um, for for most of the evening until our food came and it was time to eat. And uh, that baby's so squeezable. So it was a beautiful evening when we were done with dinner and we were ready to go back to the metro station. But there were two metro stations that were closed. And so that was going to interfere with our ability uh, to get back to our hotel directly. But it was going to interfere with their ability to get back to Rotterdam Central and then get on to their um the metro line that they needed to get on to get back home. So we walked back to our hotel. It was a couple of miles, but we walked over a bridge, uh, over over the river, and it's just, just gorgeous. And we got to uh, spend time talking to the, 
the parents of the children. And the mother, Jenny, uh, was telling me about how she had lived in Rotterdam uh, for a while years ago and she hadn't liked it because it was such a modern city. And I realized, oh, it is. I mean, when we had gotten there, it was a city to me. And I didn't really, it didn't click with me that it didn't seem particularly European. Like you didn't, we didn't see old buildings everywhere. And the reason was, is because it had been bombed in World War II and pretty much destroyed. And I imagine it's because it was a port city and that was some strategic wartime effort because other towns that we were in had been, were basically untouched. Like Delft was perfectly preserved. So there was, there was some interesting modern areas where there was a lot of modern arch architecture. There is this place where there was like an apartment complex. So they were called the cube houses. And they were literally like cubes that were sort of balanced on their points. And then people lived inside. And, and there was one that you could actually go in like a museum and see what it was like. And this is before I understood about the stairways, really. But you know, tiny little... Uh, each floor was very, very tiny, maybe the kitchen and the living room on one floor and then the bedroom on another floor and then a study on another floor. And it had those, those stairways that were so treacherous. And at the time, I thought it was because, oh, it's a cube house. But no, it's just the way Dutch, <laughs> Dutch stairways were. But it gave me a different perspective on why Rotterdam looked so different than any other European city that I had seen before. And she said, because they basically had to build it from scratch, they made changes to how they planned the city that were very different from what other European cities were like. Up, to, up until that point, if you needed to make a delivery to shop or restaurant, the truck had to park right in front of the shop or the restaurant or whatever and then basically it shut down the street it would block any traffic from coming and going um, because the deliveries were always made through the front door but when they planned Rotterdam after the war they set it up so that deliveries would come to the back entrance that they would have a back entrance for deliveries to be made and that was the first city in Europe to do that so so that she 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 didn't like Rotterdam when she first lived there but then she grew to, to like it and appreciate uh, some of the, the differences that it has and some of the advantages that, that it has. Uh, but it was interesting to, to discover that it just seemed so much like a normal city because it was so modern. So we were only in Rotterdam for a few days and then we were in Amsterdam and we checked out of our hotel on Easter Sunday. And because it was a Sunday, and especially because it was Easter Sunday, I wasn't really sure where we were going to get breakfast. So we could have gotten in, in our hotel, but they wanted a lot of money for breakfast, and we didn't want a ton to eat. So I was looking for, and, and I noticed the previous days that, like on Friday, when we went to get breakfast, places weren't even opening for breakfast until 9.30, which we thought was unusual like in the city you'd think they would have been open before people went to work but so that was on a weekday and then this was going to be a weekend on a holiday so I was and I have a daughter one daughter's vegan and one's vegetarian so I was looking for a place to eat breakfast that had vegan and vegetarian options that was going to be open on Easter and that would be open before noon and and then it had to be on this tram system, either walkable or on this tram system so that we could actually go there. So I was searching around and I found a place. And one of the things that we also had to look for was how did it take payment? When we were in the Netherlands five years ago, that was when the credit cards here in the United States were first getting the little chips. And that was the system that they used in Europe was the chip and pin system. And we had chips on our credit cards back then, but we had to sign. And we could we could use them. We didn't have a problem using them, but they always had to print out a receipt and we had to sign it where everybody else would use their credit, their card, and then they would just put, put their pin in. But when we were there five years ago, most of the time we were either doing very touristy things in Amsterdam or we were in Belgium. So this time 
our credit card was not, the same credit card that we had used five years ago was not, it was getting rejected. And we thought, oh, we had forgotten to call the credit card company and let them know we're going to be in the Netherlands. They should have known since we had paid for our airplane tickets and all, and our train ticket, you know, all the, all these different things that we had paid for should have been obvious to them. So we, we called them and they said, well, we don't see any, any activity on your credit card at all. So, cause our card had just been denied every time. So we were able to use our debit card from our checking account, and which is also can be used as a credit card. We have that option here. Uh, we were able to use that at the hotel and to buy train tickets and all those kinds of things. Um, and what we discovered was that, that in the Netherlands, they have these Dutch debit cards that have no numbers on the front and they just tap it and and the amount gets deducted from there. So the Dutch people hardly ever have credit cards. Nobody uses credit cards. So when you want to go to a restaurant, they might only take cash or they might say only take card and the card that they take may or may not include the debit card that we use. It might just be the kind of card um, that their, their Dutch debit cards are. So you, you can never tell. So I, when I looked at the website for this vegan restaurant, it said card only. And so, and I didn't have any euros at that point. I hadn't changed any money over. So I only had American dollars and I had my debit card. So we were on our way to this restaurant and my daughter said, did you pick this restaurant because there's a yarn shop on the same block? And I said, no, I didn't know that it had one. And so we were, we were walking toward the restaurant and I saw this yarn shop and it was called um, Yavol, and which I understand now is kind of a joke, like Yavol means, I guess, yes, but it also means yes, well. So anyway, so I took pictures of the inside, but it was Easter Sunday. It was not open on Sundays anyway, and it certainly wasn't open on Easter Sunday. Um, and we got to the restaurant and they only took <laughs> the Dutch kind of card. And um, so then we had to try to figure out how we're going to feed them. And then Nina realized that she had her, her Dutch card that she could use that belonged to the Dutch family that she normally uses to buy groceries. So we used that and then paid paid the family back. But that was something we were having to, to look out for. And I finally did uh, exchange some dollars for cash so that it, most of the time I could, I could um, either pay cash for something or use my debit card. But there were times when there were some establishments that would not take any form of payment that we had. So that made me wonder, well, what do Dutch people go do when they go, say, to the United States? Because the kind of cards that they have aren't going to work over here. So the, the pie knockers said that when Jenny travels, because she travels for her job quite a bit, when she goes to the United States, she has to find her credit card because they have, they have a credit card that they never use unless she's on an international trip. So that was an interesting thing. She's, you know, and the good thing is she says the Dutch people, they don't really have debt. Uh, but it does make it tricky when you're coming there to visit or when they're coming to us to visit. On Easter, we took the train up to Amsterdam and in Amsterdam, we stayed in an Airbnb. And so this was a private home. Um, and because uh, Dutch kids were on a two week vacation, the family that normally lives there, they were um, traveling with their two kids. And so they had their home open as an Airbnb. So it was in the De Pipe area of Amsterdam, which is where, um, very close to all the museums, like walking distance to all the museums, tons of restaurants and grocery stores and shops and everything in the neighborhood. All the streets are named after impressionist uh, painters, which was really fun to see. And so the house that we stayed in was built in 1878 and you had to go up it's a fair number of steps to get to the front door and for the address where we were staying there were two front doors one of the the front doors was for the apartment we were staying in and our apartment was that main floor that ground level floor and then the the floor below there so the bedrooms were down below sort of the garden level and then the living room and kitchen were on this main level but because they had that level, then they also had the back gardens. They had a trampoline and they had a little patio with chairs and stuff. It was very, and the weather was so beautiful. So we were able to sit outside 
uh, in the afternoons and uh, and enjoy coffee or a beer or a glass of wine or something. And it was really, really nice. But all the houses, of course, are very close together. And there's people in the three floors above. The second door was for the three apartments that were above ours. So when people had their windows open, they, you could hear them talking. They could hear you talking. So you had to, you know, be be aware of making noise. But it was really a really fun thing um, to to experience. And so our first day there, we went to the Reichs Museum, which is the National Museum, and they were having a special Rembrandt exhibit. They have hundreds of pieces of Rembrandt's art and they had done a special exhibit where it didn't cost extra money but you did have to have a ticket uh, so they could limit the number of people crowding through there. And they had it was called all the Rembrandts and it was all of the Rembrandt pieces of art that they owned with the exception of Night Watch and then the two pieces of art that flank them which are in the honors gallery. They have a special gallery of like really, really famous works of art by famous artists. Like there's a couple of Vermeers in there and, and then these giant Rembrandt paintings. Um, those stayed where they normally do, but everything else was in this exhibit. And it was fascinating because they had done, the pieces of art were, uh, were in different rooms and each room had a theme. So the first room was uh, Rembrandt's self-portraits and it had drawings that he had done of himself when he was first learning to be an artist and you could tell that he'd been looking in the mirror and he would make making all these different kinds of faces and drawing those and then there were paintings that he had done of himself when he was in his 50s and let me tell you that guy he knew how to paint the detail in the paintings is incredible and i remember when we were in amsterdam like five years ago we went to the van gogh museum or the van Gogh museum how close you could get to the paintings and the, the, the detail in them is incredible. So there was this one painting or this one room that was like portraits of you know, wealthy people that, he, that would have commissioned him to do their portraits. And there, was a por there were these two portraits of this young married couple and they were wearing all their finery. And I took a picture of the stockings of one of the guys because stockings. But just the amount of detail in in the things that were on his shoes it's just it just it was just mind blowing so and it was amazing to see to be able to be so so close they would have a line on the floor and they didn't want you to get more closer than about a foot but you know you couldn't help but kind of lean in and and, and see what what was going on in these paintings it's just amazing it's you know, when you see a photograph of these masterpieces or you see even if you can look on your computer and you can blow them up big and see the detail, it's not the same as seeing the actual texture and being able to move around and seeing how the light changes what's reflected off the canvases. Just incredible. So when we left the museum, and that was the fourth time my daughter had been there. She has a museum pass and she said she's never seen the same thing twice there. She, it's such a huge museum. But as we were le leaving, we were walking in this sort of underground tunnel. They have very classy buskers <laughs> at the Rijksmuseum. They don't have, you know, people blowing a trumpet or something. They have classical musicians who are playing music outside of the Rijksmuseum. It's really, really fun. <laughs> So on Tuesday, we went back down to Pinocker for a barbecue with uh, the Pinocker family. And so we took the train from Amsterdam down to Leiden. Now it's mid to late April in the Netherlands. And so it's peak tulip season and near Leiden is where the major tulip fields are. Uh, we got to Leiden and Leiden I had wanted to see because that is where the Mayflower passengers had been living in the Netherlands. When they had left England and then they were living in the Netherlands, it was in Leiden. And then they left Leiden to go and establish P Plymouth Colony back in 
1620. But I was curious just to see, you know, to walk around the town. So my, my husband had wanted to do a bicycling um, thing. So he, he went and rented an electric bike and did um, a tour on his own on the bike paths because the, the entire countryside has got bike paths. It's the whole, the whole country set up for bikers. It's an amazing bike culture there. Um, so he did that and the girls and I, I said, well, there's a yarn shop in Leiden and it's open. So I would like to go there and I just walk through the town and see it. And it's the cutest, most charming town. It's just like so picturesque, just beautiful. And there's canals and the sun was shining and it's just gorgeous. And as we were walking through, there's a big like classic Dutch windmill. And we were looking, I, I want to just get up close to it. And it was a museum. So we went in. And we got to see what a, a windmill was like and how how it was set up inside. And, and apparently, traditionally, they uh, were co-owned. There would be two owners of a windmill, and then the bottom floor would be divided, and each family would live on what, in one half of the main floor. So we got to see how that was furnished. And this particular windmill was owned like that, and it had been torn down and then rebuilt at various times over the, over the years. But the last owner... Um, there was a single owner, so he had taken down, I guess, the center wall, and he had the whole main floor, um, I think. That's what they were saying. So we got to see how the kitchen and every and their living quarters and everything were, were set up. And it's a windmill, and so there are multiple floors, and they have those steep Dutch stairways, only instead of being, you know, circular like this, they're just steep like that with kind of it's basically like a ladder with a little bit wider tread on them, except that for each floor, they got steeper and narrower. And so there was probably four or five floors that we went up and it was okay going up, but then, then yeah, we had to come down, we had to come down and there were these steep ladders. And I was, you know, reading all the different signs that they had and they would talk about, like they had the, these like squares on the floor were open for you to just go up, you know, from one place to another. But they were talking about how there would be a trap door. And this is kind of when this concept of tra what trap door actually means. And then I realized in Dutch, the word for stairs is trap. And... So that started to make sense to me with a trap door is a door to the trap where the, where the stairs or the ladder is. Um, that it just came to me that, oh, that's what all of this means. And that's where we get this phrase trap door from. So we walked to the yarn shop, which was on a beautiful, cute little canal. And there were some buildings there that had been built in the 1600s. And my, my daughter's been learning Dutch and she can read a lot of Dutch and she can tell us what things mean. And, and there was a, a building that said something like 1648. So we had a date above it. And then there was a picture of a cow and a horse. And then it was a little tunnel that was going to the back. And and had words under it. And I said, well, what does it say? And she was looking at it. She's like, I have no idea. She said, that is old Dutch. It doesn't, it's just random letters to me. I have no idea. So if any of you are from the Netherlands and you know what the sign says or what it means, I would love to know. So from light, we met up back up at the train station and then we, we took the train a few more minutes down to The Hague and walked around and we saw where Parliament is. So the Netherlands has, I don't, it's, I don't know if they call it a dual capital or whatever, but the capital of the Netherlands is Amsterdam, but the Parliament, the legislation, legislators are in The Hague. And so... Uh, we went and saw those buildings and there's a lot of gold on some of these buildings. And so it was, it was pretty, and we just sat there and kind of looked at it and, um, and then walked back to the train station and then went on to Pine Ocker and for our barbecue. So my younger daughter who graduated from college as a, with a graphic design degree in December has been living with us for the past few months. She got her portfolio put together and she was doing research on what 
city she wanted to live in and then doing research on what sorts of graphic design jobs are available and she finally figured out she wanted to live in Chicago. She got an apartment lined up, had one roommate, needed to find one more roommate and she had been applying for jobs and right before we left she had a job interview through Google Hangouts um, with a company down in Chicago and that interview seemed to go really well. Well then they wanted a second interview they told her right before we left for the Netherlands and she had to tell them when she couldn't uh, interview with them like on the days that we were traveling. So when we got to the Netherlands they had a phone interview uh, scheduled for her uh, went on the day we went to Delft. So when we came back from Delft she had a, a phone interview in the hotel room using Google Hangouts. It's like an, this amazing world that we live in that you can do that. So after that second interview, the HR person said, well, I have a weekly meeting on Wednesdays with the art director. And so sometime by Friday, you should, he you should hear something from me. So there's a time difference, seven hour time difference. And so we were at dinner at this brewery and my daughter got an email that said, from the ER, from the HR person said she wanted to touch base with her. And she's like, oh, what do you think it means? What do you think it means? I'm like, well, she's going to offer you a job. Really? Really? You think so? I'm like, yeah, tell her we'll be home in an hour and, and you can do a call then. So she, sure enough, she got a call and got a job offer. So that all <laughs> was just falling into place. Originally, the intent was that after her graduation, she'd come home, She'd get a week or so to pack up all her stuff and then she'd move to uh, Chicago and then she'd continue her job search. But instead, she's going to be coming back from commencement, packing up in two days, moving down to Chicago immediately and then starting, uh, starting her new job, which means we have one more trip to do is when we get back from Boston, we'll have a couple of days to recover and then we have one more trip. So it's been quite a month and it's going to be another couple of weeks of uh, busy, busy, busy for us, but it's exciting to see uh, our children growing up and becoming adults, and uh, it's just it's just been a delightful thing to see. So I I finished the little uh, green socks for the little five year old, and I'll be washing these and then sending them off to the Netherlands, and hopefully he will like these socks. So this is that Regia perfect yarn for kids. So there's 60 gram balls of yarn. And so these are the ones I originally started uh, with orange yarn and the socks were too tight. And so then he decided instead of me re-knitting the orange ones, he decided he wanted green. So I was only happy, too happy to comply with his wishes. So in other knitting news, when we got back, once again, our flight left in the evening, and this time we got back in the evening. And, but it was much, it was much harder. I didn't get to be a full zombie for, before going to sleep, and so it, it took me several days to kind of get over that jet lag. I keep waking up at three thirty in the morning. So on Saturday, well on Friday, our first day back, I got my sewing machine out and I did the buttonholes and the buttons for my Edwardian sweater and I started sewing that in and then Saturday morning I woke up at 3.30 and I just finished seaming things in and I, I wove in all the ends for um, the yarn tails in and I have one button left to go because my daughter, the one that's graduating, ha has decided that she actually wants this sweater that she would wear it. So rather than me just completing it based on how it was completed a hundred and some years ago, I want to complete it in a way that she's gonna be happy with. So when she gets back, after commencement, she's in Boston right now for senior week. When she gets back, I'll have her try it on and figure out exactly where the button should be. And I will photograph her or videotape her wearing that sweater so that you can see it. But in the meantime, I'll show you what it looks like so far on me. Now, I'm taller than women were 115 years ago. So, uh, and I'm a little, little tall in the body. So I just knit it exactly as it was written. And so it doesn't fit me exactly the way it would have fit somebody a hundred years ago, but it, you can get the idea. So the back is shorter than the front. So this is 
how it fits in the back. There are, of course, fewer stitches on the back. The front, it has, each half of the front has as many stitches as the back has, which is what helps to create the blousing. And there were short rows worked in the front to uh, make that longer. So from what I can see of pictures, the you know, women were corseted, but this would come down a little bit like this, but this would also blouse out. Now in the photographs, uh, the photograph of the woman wearing the sweater from 1907, she has a lot more blousing. Like she, it's, it's just more bloused because I imagine because her arms are shorter. <laughs> Um, but this, you know, this does puff a little bit, but it's, it's a, it's an interesting, uh, sweater. I don't know that I can necessarily pull it off, but, um, I think my daughter can and wants to, and, um, it actually turned out way better looking in person than I would have thought it would look. Uh, I just thought it would look, and I still think it looks a little weird on me walking around. <laughs> but, um, and so I closed, I can pull this on and off with everything buttoned. I've got three of these kind of pearl buttons at the bottom. I sewed those on, I just pushed them through the ribbing. So I didn't, I was trying to figure out how to do button loops and I didn't like the way they were looking. So I just, as a temporary measure, just pushed them through and they looked okay. And so here is where the two fronts meet and I have um, them buttoned in. It's a real pain to button into the buttonhole so that the button is between the ribbon and the fabric here. Um, but once it's, it's done, it's done and you can just pull it on over your head. So the only button that I think will ever have to be actually buttoned once it's on is the one on the neck. And that one, I'm still trying to figure out how I'm going to arrange for that button to work. <laughs> Um, and then my daughter will figure out where she wants it to be. So um, again, because I'm longer, this doesn't blouse out as much as it would for a woman back at that time. I had some questions about how I was going to wash and block it. And I would wash and block it like I would wash and block any sweater. I haven't washed and blocked this yet. I'll soak it with some wool wash for at least half an hour, if not overnight. I'll squeeze the water out and then I'll lay it flat. So I will show you that I'll record that for next week and show you the before and after of washing and blocking and as well as show you my daughter modeling um, the sweater. She has plans for wearing very, some high-waisted pants with it or a skirt or uh, something, I don't know. But um, she's the fashionista, not me. Uh, another, there was a suggestion over and over over the weeks when I was trying to decide how I was going to close this in the front. So many people suggested hooks and eyes. Now I've used a hook and eye on one sweater. It's a sweater that's kind of a skimpy sweater. It just kind of meets here in the front and it kind of cuts away. Here it's a V-neck and it cuts away. And so that, that single hook helps to hold um, the two fronts together but it's holding them together because otherwise they want to pull apart. And now in other situations, you might use a, a hook like for my pants right here, I have a, a, a hook right here. But again, there is tension pulling on the, the hook to try to keep it from, um, from opening. So for hook and eye, you either have two pieces of fabric, they're lying flat, and so the edges are next to each other, and you, you put in a hook to keep those edges from pulling apart from each other. Uh, or another situation would be they might overlap a little bit, but again, the hook is is to keep them from from pulling apart from each other. On your on your bra, you'll have hooks too. Those are very stretchy, and those hooks are are preventing things from opening that way. That's not going to work for this type of situation because first of all, there's no tension. There's all this extra fabric, and the two edges are not like this. And they're not overlapping. They're like this. It's like instead of you know your pinkies um, facing each other, or instead of uh, the two hands one on top of the other like this, the palms or the back sides of the fabric are facing each other. So there's no way to put a hook in there really and make that work. The second problem is that even with that single hook and eye that I have in that one sweater, 
that hook wants to get caught. Is when I'm putting it on, I'm trying to get it caught. It wants to catch on other stitches. This sweater has 17 buttons that you can't see and the three at the bottom that you can see. 17 hooks would be a nightmare. Like it just as you're trying to get a to, to put the sweater on, it, they would just, it would just be terrible. And so there's, it, it's just not a good solution for this particular situation. I'm not 100% sure that I really solved the closure problem uh, correctly because the photograph that's in uh, the 1907 version of the Columbia B Book of Yarns, it's very difficult to see what's actually going on. Um, but this is a solution that is working, and as long as my daughter is happy, then I'll be happy. So the last thing that I wanted to mention, because several people had asked about it uh, two weeks ago when I was talking about uh, my experience at Ply Away, I'd mentioned that my dog Herbie, that I had gotten some concerning news about my dog. And some people who were there at Ply Away and, and saw, you know, the messages and I was getting um, had, had asked about him the next day were really concerned. And um, the short answer is that Herbie got very sick very quickly and um, that he was in the ICU at the University Veterinary uh, Clinic all weekend and on Monday things were not looking promising. And so we made the decision to say goodbye to him. Well, that's it for this week's Casual Friday. If you have any comments or questions about today's video or suggestions for videos you'd like to see in the future, you can leave those down in the comments below or join the discussion in my Ravelry group, Rocks Rocks. Thanks for watching and I'll see you next week.